Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing with experts in functional medicine, integrative medicine, biohacking, and all kinds of fun topics, as you know well if you've followed us before. Uh, join us today with a new expert. I'm so excited to dive into his expertise in child's health, how to raise a healthy child as a title, um, and especially to talk about his new book. Our expert, Dr. Joel Wash, um, aka Dr. Joel Gator, is a popular parenting Instagram account and a board certified pediatrician in Los Angeles. He specializes in parenting, wellness, and integrative medicine. He's the author of a recently released book, Parenting at Your Child's Pace, the Integrative Pediatrician's Guide to the First Three Years. Welcome, Dr. Gator. Glad to have you on the show. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. So we don't know each other well, but we got introduced by a, a mutual PR company that is fantastic. And I'm so excited when they reached out. I was just like, yes, this is a great, great topic for our audience. Um, what I love to start with is kind of your journey into medicine. And then how did you get into pediatrics specifically? So. For medicine, you know, when going back to when I was younger, I grew up in Toronto, Canada. I, um, of course, had to play hockey and, you know, loved sports and things like that. And and as I was growing up, um, I started coaching my brother in, in hockey and baseball and realized I loved working with kids and then continued on working in camps and kind of running camps. And so I, I, I guess from a younger age, found that I just loved teaching um, and being around kids. And so then when I went through school, I really loved science also. And so that kind of seemed like a natural blend and and I went into med school was always to become a pediatrician because I felt that I could do the most good and help kids early on and get ahead of things uh, and so that's what really led me into to pediatrics and then um, so now I'm an integrative pediatrician so as I was going through training I was never you know very woo woo or out there integrative when I was growing up I had pretty normal life you know I would say in terms of the things that I ate eating junk food and, uh -huh. and going out to restaurants and things like that. But I met my now wife in residency and uh, she's pretty holistic minded. Also got a little bit frustrated through training with medications for everything, super short visits, seeing people go outside of the system and get better, seeing patients not get better, giving out medications like they were candy. And so that's what led me to start learning about integrative medicine and functional medicine. And and of course, once you start learning about that, you can't go back. Um, and And I've just kind of continued on that trajectory from there. Wow, I love that story. It's so common to all of us, right? It's like the virus. We get the virus of the integrative because what truly mm -hmm. most of us went into medicine is to solve problems and to help people heal and to and so if we're truly open minded and dedicated to that as a core, well then what really works? And granted, I love conventional medicine. I'm an MD, you know, so same kind of story. Um, so I still use medications, I still prescribe drugs, all that stuff, but it's like um, my toolbox is bigger now, like yours, right? So we have more options and we have more options that are less um, maybe traumatic or tragic or, or toxic, all the T words um, mm -hmm. for our patients and especially when it comes to children. Um, so I, I love that story because so often we see, oh wait, there may be other solutions out there that we weren't taught in medical school. And then when we open our minds to that, there's like some pretty powerful stuff. Um, right. No, I was, I was just going to say, because I, I agree totally with that. And, and I... I'm not against Western medicine at all. I say it all the time. I think that's very key. Like there's so many amazing things that we have created and we can cure things that would have killed you just a few decades ago. But especially in the last you know, decade, two decades, we're way too quick to give medications. Yes. It's the first option often. And, and kids are on medications like most, you know, most kids, like more than half. I mean, mm -hmm. we're just seeing things explode that, that we're never there before chronic disease rates are out of control. Like 50% of kids have a chronic disease. Autism is skyrocketing. Autoimmune conditions are skyrocketing. ADHD is skyrocketing. Everything is skyrocketing. And the solution to that isn't more medication. It can be helpful. It can be a band-aid. Some kids do need a medication and that's great. But most of the time you don't. And most of the time there are at least a lot of other things you should try first um, or things you can do in conjunction with modern medicine. And I have found for sure in my practice that if you do think in that way, you could really decrease the medications you give kids. And you can sometimes reverse or turn around conditions that these families were told were for, for life. Yeah, so I couldn't agree more. And one thing we can start with, and I'd love to know your opinion and thoughts is 
gut microbiome, we're finding more and more and more research on the gut brain connection, the gut heart connection, the mood disorder connection. And I could go on and on pretty much every system can be correlated in some way to our microbiome health. Now, what's happened over the decades that we were in medical school and even right out of medical school um, was there's been frequency of prescription antibiotics, which of course disrupts the microbiome. And thank goodness, even the conventional system is shifting away from um, quickly prescribing without knowing a good cause. What's your thoughts on um, the antibiotic use in children? Um, obviously, there's a time and place for that. How do you approach that with parents that might just be looking for a prescription and maybe need a little bit more education on why that's not always the best thing for the microbiome? Yeah, I think that's a great introduction to that topic because the first thing that's so key is, is just what you mentioned, like just acknowledging that it matters, right? I, I think that's something that's so important in modern medicine. I do think, like you said, that the concept of the microbiome is permeating into modern medicine. So I think that's good. I think most doctors are aware of it, but I still don't think that um, mainstream medicine really thinks about it before they give a prescription. Like, I think it's like, oh, you know, your ear hurts. Here's a prescription for a, an ear infection. Oh, you had a cough for a week. Okay, here's your prescription for that cough. And maybe it's pneumonia. Like, I, I don't think that we give a respect that we need to, to the microbiome because yes, yeah, sometimes an antibiotic can save your life. That's fine. But usually you don't need it. Most of the time it's viral. Most of the time things will get better. And oftentimes there are at least five, 10, 20 things you can try before using an antibiotic, unless it's very serious. I mean, there are situations where it's, it's warranted, but you know, one of the big things I talk about in the book is um, one of the most important questions you need to ask as a parent before taking an antibiotic is why, what is it for? I think that is so key, especially if you go into an urgent care, yes. you know, they're going to pretty much always give you an antibiotic for any complaint that you ask for ear pain, uh, sore throat, they're going to just do it just to cover their butts. Right. And, and I almost have never seen anybody come to my office after going to urgent care and not be given a prescription. A lot of times the parents will message me like, Oh, I got a prescription for this. Do you need, you think I need to take it? And, and I really think it's important that parents start to understand that doctors want to give you something a lot of the time. And if you're there, they feel like, oh, you want an antibiotic. You want something. You don't want to leave with nothing. And they also want to cover their butt just in case it's that one in a hundred situation where something could go wrong. So they're going to give you that medication, even if you don't necessarily need it. But if you ask the question, like, do I really need this? What are we treating? Then you get that next level of, of discussion. And a lot of times you'll actually be surprised. The doctor will say, well, you know, I'm not sure, you know, it seems like it could be bacterial, but it's not so bad. So if you want to hold on to it for a day or two, maybe you can try this or this and then take it if it doesn't get better. And if you do that most of the time, you never actually need to take the medication or they might say, oh, and you know what, we did a test and it's for strep throat and, and I really think you need it. Or we did an x-ray and it looks like there's pneumonia. So we want to treat it. I mean, that's a very different thing than, well, you have a cough and, and just here's your antibiotic and it matters. I mean, you know, these things, the research shows that even in the first six months, if you had one course yes. of antibiotics, it increases your risk for allergies and autoimmune conditions and eczema. So it matters. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it, it, we shouldn't do it unless we really need it. Yeah, no, I love that. So let's talk real practically. If parents listening out there, say there's a parent coming in with their two-year-old child, maybe a low-grade fever, there's no red flags, um, there's no strep positive, um, you think maybe it's viral, what kinds of suggestions would you give that they could give um, some relief to their child who's maybe crying and fussy and not feeling great, but you're mm -hmm. pretty certain that they don't need an antibiotic? What would you give them for advice first? Yeah. So in, in those situations, it obviously depends on what the symptoms are, but I would say in general, like immune support type things can be really helpful. And there are, there's a lot that actually has really great evidence that it can shorten viruses. So vitamin D has a ton of research. Vitamin C has a ton of research, elderberry and zinc. I mean, these things are um, very well researched to help on most, most viral symptoms. So those are good things that you can think about a multivitamin an omega, potentially a probiotic. The, those are the, you know, kind of the, the front lines, I would say of things that you can usually take. There are other things too. There are homeopathics that you can do. Yeah um as well but but i think of course it's situation dependent but yeah. but these are the basics that most 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 you know natural crunchy parents i guess are right. <laughs> have in their home that you can just have just in case when once you see some symptoms pop up yeah no i love that um so the title of your book parenting at your child's pace speaks to maybe a different way of perceiving how we parent so not just the medical piece but tell us more what does that title really mean to you and how did you delve into it in your book you it, to me, one of the biggest issues right now in parenting is comparison. Uh, I feel like we're in this new world of information and no one ever taught us how to 
live in it. No one ever taught us how to parent in it. And it makes it very difficult. I, I have, even in my not super long career, have seen a shift in, to increase stress in parenting, parents not trusting their gut, not trusting that they know what to do. And I think that's because there's just such an information overload that even little decisions seem so big. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, back in the day, maybe even 50 years ago, if you wanted to think about, well, what do I feed my kid first and when? You ask grandma, you know, yeah. and they're like, oh, you know, we did peas at six months. Okay, great. Uh -huh. So you do that. And that was it, you know, unless you wanted to go to the library and read a book, you know, that, that was all that you needed to do. But now you have grandma's opinion and then you have your friend's opinion and your cousin's opinion and the influencer on the internet. And then the article you just read and half the time, one thing says the complete opposite of the other one. And it's like, you should never give carrots first. And the other one says, you have to give carrots first. Yes. And so <laughs> it, it puts parents into this place where it's very difficult to kind of synthesize that information sometimes and you don't trust yourself and you're really comparing to other people and social media. And I really do think we need to get back to trusting our gut and and focusing on our own family and our own kids because you do truly know what's best and it doesn't mean that you can't google it doesn't mean that you can't go online but i think that we need to get the information synthesize it for ourselves, and then to the best of our ability figure out what's the best thing to do and then just try that and trust our gut that we're going to know what's best and so to me that's what parenting at your child's pace is it's really focusing back on your family and not so much on everybody else out there because they don't know your family as well as you do uh, what a great answer, because I think this goes for um, uh, for sure for parents in your world, but really for all of us. And I love the idea that we really do know what's best for our bodies. So often, even with me, with my adult patients, part of the, the um, therapy, part of the healing, a huge part is allowing that patient to be able to trust in themselves again, where they've lost that contact with their own somatic signals of like stomach ache, what does this mean? And then they go into a spiral of fear. And again, same with a parent and a child. And they're like, oh no, what does this mean? What is this? Where, whereas actually if we touch base, well, maybe that means we need to slow down or maybe we ate the wrong thing or, you know, maybe something really simple, but we start to relegate the authority to some, someone else. And sadly, it'd be great if it was a clinician or someone like you or I, who, who maybe has medical expertise, but even now, even worse nowadays, it's more often an influencer who has no degree, no business giving advice out there, and they just have a large following. So it's very much um, uh, disturbing of the kinds of advice they're getting. So how do you encourage a parent to really touch base with this intuitive sense? Because I love that at the core, we really, really do know how to heal. Our bodies were innately made to heal, whether it's us helping our children or us helping ourselves, but people have lost touch with that. So how do you encourage that reconnection to um, innate wisdom? Yeah, I, I always just try to remind parents that it's within us. I mean, it's something that is there and it has always been there. And if anything, we have more information than ever. It's a less stressful time than ever. I mean, yes, of course, there are a lot of stresses, but a lot of the things that we stress about as parents are actually so much better than they ever used to be. Um, you know, like we have access to information if we need to. We can call 911 if we need to. We have safety standards and seatbelts and helmets and pool guards and uh, an emergency room, like all these things that we never used to have before. And the vast majority of decisions that we make as a parent are not life or death. They're not urgent. You don't have to always get it right the first time. So we don't have to make every single decision to be as big as I think we're, we're making it to be. The key is to try to tune out some of that noise and to not let the internet scare you. I think because everyone's like, you have to do it this way. You have to do it this way. My way is the only way. And we have to remember that people are almost always trying to sell you something. So their way isn't always the best way. It's just the way that they do it. And also um, in a litigious society or just in general with the way things are, everything's so extreme. So you're trying to get attention. Uh, you're trying to talk about the worst possible scenario for everything like, oh, some gas. Okay. Gas doesn't necessarily mean you have ulcerative colitis. It's one yes. of the symptoms, yes. but, and so if you Google that and you see that, then it might make you really scared, but common things being common, it's usually mild. And so you have some time in general for almost everything to trust your gut, do what you think is best. And then most of parenting is really just that circular watching your kids, seeing what they do and then figuring out what works best. And you don't always know, but you have to trust yourself that you will know that you're either doing the best thing for them, or if it isn't the best choice, you're going to see that and you're going to make a change. And you're going to continually adjust as you go. And that's what most of parenting is. It's not about having the most money. It's not about knowing everything because money doesn't buy you love. You know, money doesn't buy you the things that are most important when it, when it comes to parenting. And, and certainly nobody knows what they're doing before they become a parent. So you just figure it out as you go. Everybody does. 
Gosh, what good, good advice. As you're speaking, I'm thinking of this thing that came across my social media feed not too long ago, and I just had a lap of the extremity. So it was a car like flying into the water of a river. It's being submerged. And it's like, what do you what are you going to do if you get submerged in your car and you can't get out? Here's this device that you need to buy mm -hmm. because if you get submerged in this car, this is the only thing that's going to get you out of there. I'm rolling my eyes going, how likely is it? I mean, I bet it's like a one in a million. I don't know the statistic, but the mm -hmm. idea of being submerged in a car is has to be so small in percentage of possibility. And then you're going to find that little cutter. Right. And, the, and then, yeah, that in your panic, you're going to have in your car, you're going to find that. But of course, what it was doing is it was feeding on the fear of being submerged, right? Which is like drowning, mm -hmm. being burned, all these things that we have in natural fear. And I was just like rolling my eyes going, this is insane because there are people like, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid I'm going to go buy that device. And I'm like, this is mm -hmm. ridiculous. And that's how it is with medical advice, with parenting. Like, oh my gosh, you, like you said, you have a small symptom, you have a headache. Oh, there's a brain tumor, right? You have a little bit of gas and bloating. Oh no, I have Crohn's or colitis. And it's just not true most of the time. So this uh, sanity in parenting is really, really important and not going down that spirit, that spiral of fear. So yeah. how do you, um, let's talk to the subset of patient or it's patients. And it's, I say patients because your parents are your patients too, right? Your children, let's talk to the parents. Mostly our office, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you didn't know with getting into pediatrics. You got two patients every time. Oh yeah. But, for those out there that are a little bit more anxious about how do I raise my kid? I want to be a great parent and all that. And it all comes from a good source. How would you talk to them about that anxiety when it becomes obsessive or becomes so fearful that it really is um, interfering with a healthy parenting? I, I think a lot of it comes back to recognizing what's important for you and what's important for your family. And sometimes we need to take a step back and remember that healthy parents are the most important thing for our kids. And all too often we forget about ourselves. You know, we especially when you're a young parent, young mom, young dad, um, you know, we're not sleeping very much. Uh, <laughs> things are stressful no matter on the best, you know, best case scenario. And so anything that has to do with you kind of pushes, gets pushed to the side. And I think it's so key that, that, you know, if you do identify that you're a little bit more stressed, you're a little bit more anxious, then that's something that is important to look into. I think you need to understand that, that that's real and that's important. And, and you work on yourself too, whether it's working with the therapist, working on strategies, or just taking the time to put yourself back into the equation. It's really easy to put everything onto your kids. And I think that's great. I mean, I think good parenting, you know, we put a lot of our time into our kids, but you also have to count too. And sometimes, especially if you're in that situation where you, you're noticing you're getting a lot more stressed, you're not getting, um, you know, what you feel like you need, then sometimes you have to put yourself in and, you know, go hang out with your friends, go gardening, go for a walk, whatever it is that works for you just to decrease that stress a little bit. I think that's really important. And if you are just a very anxious person, then I think, you know, just like anybody else working on that is really key um, because our kids see what we do and they see our anxiety and it feeds their anxiety and that we already have enough, you know, we have a huge issue with mental health at this point. It's, it's a very, very big issue. And so the, the best thing that we can do for them, especially with their mental health is focus on ours too. So that way we can have a calm environment as calm as possible for them. Uh, so this segues so well into another question I have for you, and that's modeling. Um, I feel like uh, parenting, so much of it is really doing the very best that we can to choose good habits, whether it's the kinds of foods that we eat, the amount of time we spend on social media, the sleep hours we sleep, and just even in our relationships, whether we're co-parenting or have a partner or family or however that living situation looks like, um, even just relationship and communication. Um, how important is modeling healthy behaviors and healthy relationships and healthy communication to a children, you know, the children's health? I think it's one of the most vital things. I, 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 we have such a chronic disease epidemic. There's so many things going on, whether you're talking about mental health or, or physical health or both together. And it's not just the kids, it's the parents too. And a lot of it filters down. And so if we're not modeling um, good behaviors or modeling the behaviors that we want for them, there's no way that they're going to do it. I mean, you can't expect them to not eat the Oreo cookies if you are. You can't expect them to go for a walk if you are not. You can't expect them to not be on their phones or their screens all day if you are. Like You have to model those things. And so if there are some priorities for you that what you want for them, you have to do it too. I think that's key. Like it's really never, I mean, it's almost never going to happen if you don't do that as well. So yes, I think it's really, really important to practice what you preach. And especially in those arenas like healthy eating 
exercise, screen time. Those are big areas that our kids are watching us all day, every day. And if you want them to make some changes, then you do it as a family. And I think that makes it a lot easier and, and a lot more reasonable. It's really unreasonable to expect your teenager to not be on their phone if you are, or it's not really reasonable for them to, to not eat the Doritos if you have it in the house and you are. Yeah, no, I love that. I think I think that's so critical. And and again, the work that we when we transform ourselves, it really trickles down to our loved ones, our partners. We know the statistics about the kinds of friends that we keep, the kind of people that we are married to or in partnership with, and those habits do equate to our own habits. So whether it's being overweight or underweight or healthy eating or not healthy eating or exercises, we actually are very similar in social circles. So it really also affects our children. Uh, mental health. This is absolutely um, increasing. The, uh, the proportion um, of increase in incidents, I think it was like a 400% increase in prescriptions for antidepressants, which is just really a, um, a mediator to the amount of depression that's really out there. So let's talk to parents about their kids. If they, What are kind of some red flags that they might want to look for for depression anxiety? Um, when can they maybe, you know, have a talk with them or implement some diet changes or lifestyle changes? And when is it more of a serious issue when they need to get a professional involved? Talk about what parents need to know about their children's moods. Yeah, great, great question. Because I do think it is so important. And even before I answer that specific question, I think the the bigger, more important question here is, is recognizing that this is such a huge problem. It's something that we have to get ahead of. You have to assume that your kids are a little bit stressed, you have to assume they're a little bit anxious, you have to assume there might be some depression going on, because the numbers are so staggeringly high at this point, that it can't be something that you just think, oh, it's never gonna be my kids. Oh, it's not gonna be my family. It's like one third of teen girls um, are, are thinking about suicide, right? I mean, it's like really, really, really high. Um, one in two kids, I think it's about 50% of kids by the time they're 18, have a mental health diagnosis. So that means that like a lot of kids, right? Most kids have something going on. That's a diagnosis, but that's not just a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of stress. So I, I think that when you, you know, when you ask about, should we approach this? Yes, you need to talk about this. We need to be checking in with them. We need to be making sure things are okay to the best of our ability. Obviously teens don't always tell you everything, but the big key that I've always heard from the therapist is really just making sure you keep those lines of communication open consistently continuously, even if about mundane, random things, whatever it is, but they're very unlikely to talk to you about important stuff if they can't talk to you about the unimportant stuff. So I think just kind of checking in, making sure they're doing okay, talking about their life, being inquisitive, I think that is very important. So hopefully they will open up to you um, if something's going on. And then, uh, you know, of course, uh, if we're talking about red flags, you know, usually it's it depends on if it's a boy or a girl, but in generally they're kind of, um, stepping back from the usual things that they're doing, you know, they're being more reclusive, maybe their mood has changed, they're not wanting to do the things that they used to want to do. Um, they're not eating, they, they don't want to go out with their friends, like those kinds of things, if they're major change. And also when you get the younger kids, a lot of times it's more vague symptoms. Mm -hmm. So before teens like stomach aches and headaches, and they don't want to go to school. Um, so these are the kind of things we need to be inquiring, not just about medical reasons, but maybe there's something going on like bullying, um, which just these are just things that we need to be thinking of. It has to be in the differential. Um, it has to be in our, our mindset of of one of the reasons. And as a doctor too, like this is something that's more and more important to. You never want to assume it's a just mental health thing. Like you know, headache could be something like like a tumor, like you said. But that's not the more common thing. We need to be making sure and asking the questions like, what's going on at school? What's going on at home? Because th these are very common things that we see too. Um, so that, that is the, that kind of part of the question. The second part was, I forget what the second part was, it was about like maybe red flag. So when should a parent be like, Oh, this is really serious. Like, what are some of the things, even as a physician that you're like, Oh, this is, and you know, I know, but let's talk to the parents about what, when should they call a professional or seek other help outside of their family? So the, the most serious situation in medicine would be for a kid who's actively suicidal. So they, they're suicidal. They have a plan. Um, that's something that is very urgent, something you should be going to the emergency department for and having them watch. Um, if they are mentioning that they're suicidal, but don't really have an active plan, I would say not necessarily an emergency, but it's certainly extremely urgent. Um, so you definitely want to make sure they're getting support um, as needed and probably want to get them seen right away for that to kind of determine where they are. So that that is, you know, just from like the medical standpoint, the most urgent situation. And, and you know, if they're telling you that they're, you know, they're, they're suicidal, then that's something you want to take very 
seriously because most of the time if you if you get them the support that they need um yeah. you can you can move things into a different direction but if we don't take it seriously then that's a lot of times where we can run into some issues ah very very good i just want to make sure parents hear that because i didn't feel supported because there are resources out there and sometimes it feels lonely when you're there and you don't know what to do um, can i say one more thing about that because I, I think yeah. there is one more very important piece is that um one of the things you hear a lot of in the discussion is about talking about these kinds of things and some of the concerns that parents have around, well, if you talk about suicide, then they're going to do it or you know, they're going to make them more likely. And all of the research I've ever seen says that's not true. Um, it doesn't say that if you, you know, if you bring it up, if you talk about it, if you talk about their feelings, that's going to create a situation to which their child is suicidal. You basically always it's someone that's not having discussions they're not talking about it. They're they're feeling like they're alone. They're feeling like they can't talk about it. That's a much, much, much more common scenario for um suicide in those kinds of situations where it gets to that severe point so anybody that i've ever seen talk about this that's a researcher or therapist they always say it's better to talk about it. it's better to be in the open if you have concerns um don't feel like you talking about it or bringing it up is going to create the situation because if it's there it's there and talking about it's what's going to be the most helpful or at least you can open up the discussion to get them the help they need uh, so I, I could not agree more. I love that you said that. And even as physicians, same thing, we're advised. We need to ask these questions. I've done it many times in clinical practice. And, and even saying as much as, do you have a plan? What are you thinking? Because those specific questions actually help guide the treatment and the help. Um, so one thing that's kind of, I think, closely related is the rise in social media, the rise in I'm not enough or I of the comparisons and all the things that come with that. And even just the dopamine hits the screen time. I don't know if you've read Dopamine Nation by Anna Lemke or if anyone listening has seen The Social Dilemma. There's been a lot of things lately. That's a documentary that brought to light some of the real, real risk and real addictive like these companies, these social media companies actually use the neuropsychology of addiction to program. So this is very real. It's very validated. And we mm -hmm. see it in adults and children. But I think the children are more susceptible because there's such a pressure to have the phone, to be on the phone, to talk late at night. And I think it's affecting sleep patterns. I think it's affecting um, the uh, self-esteem and ego. I think it's affecting the comparisons. And what you uh, pointed out so often when patients are feeling depressed and suicidal, there's a feeling of I'm totally alone, I'm isolated, I'm not enough, and the comparison. So talk a little bit about how does social media actually make this problem a, a worse problem and how can parents support their children so that they aren't totally off the phone and, and isolated, but also really set limits appropriately for their child. Yeah, social media and, and screen time in general are a big problem right now. And I very thankful this year. This is one of, I think the best parts of this year so far is it really has become a major discussion yes. this year. I think Jonathan Haidt's book, um, that was the other one, you know, you mentioned the other good ones, but I think Jonathan Haidt's book this year, um, anxious generation really brought this to the forefront and there has been more conversation than I've ever heard about social media and kind of working our way backwards. And I do see the pendulum swinging a little bit, which I think is really good because you know, again, this goes back to, we have a huge issue. Um, mental health is a massive problem and, basically all of the research shows that the social media is causing harm to our teens. It's causing problems in school. It's decreasing their ability to focus in school. It's decreasing our ability to sleep well, increasing stress. And the, the places that have decreased it or removed social media from younger kids see huge benefits very quickly. And, and I think that's almost just common sense. It's like, if you're not focused on something all day, you could focus better in school, right? If you're not stressed about everything going on in the world, then you can be you know, more focused on what's right in front of you and actually talking to your friends around you. And I'm not, I'm not against social media. I'm not against screens. They're not going anywhere, but we're on them way too much. I mean, the average teen is on seven to nine hours of screen time a day, which is insane. I mean, it doesn't yeah. mean that you can't, you know, do your homework on a screen. You can't watch a show every now and again. Like that's fine. We all did. Um, but it's, it's so beyond that at this point. And, 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 like you said, the, the companies know what they're doing and have known what they're doing for a long time and are trying to addict everybody. And they did. Uh, and we have to push back a little bit. I think if you have a child who doesn't have screens yet or doesn't have social media, we, we need to push it back as long as we can. I think that's helpful. And, and we're moving in that direction. If you have a you know, middle-aged teen, you know, 12 to 16, 17, then, then maybe we give them flip phones instead of, um, uh -huh you know, something with a full screen so that they can get a hold of you if there's an emergency, but that they don't have access to the internet all day and maybe just on their computer or whatever. Um, you know, so they don't necessarily have no social media, but they have 
um, you know, some minimal access or no social media. I mean, I think the research shows that that's better. It's just hard. Um, but I think that as more families start to push their kids away from it, then it's not going to be the uncool thing. It'll be the normal thing. It's hard. It's hard to kids the only kid. I think that's yes. tough. Um, but if we can make the goal, like what Jonathan Haidt's saying, where we make a, you know, enough of a minority um, or even a majority of kids to not be on it, then it'll be fine. Because most kids don't want to be on social media. I mean, a lot of kids, they do it because they feel like they need to, but they know it keeps them stressed. And I think if they didn't have to be on it and they didn't feel the pressure to be on it, then a lot more kids would be okay um, using it a little bit more minimally. And 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 yeah, I think we have to be mindful. Of that. Like we love to be stressed and we, we love to, with social media. I mean, I don't know why, but like the, they know that the algorithm is pushing us towards those things. It doesn't have to be. It didn't used to be that way. I remember when social media started, it was like hanging out with your friends, seeing puppy videos, funny videos. Like it wasn't that stressful then. And it just seems like it is now. And, um, you know, maybe the companies will change the algorithm over time, but at least we can do it ourselves. We can kind of realize what's going on and, and either curate our feeds or just use it a little bit less. And, and I think that's something that we can do. But as a parent, especially at home, I think it's time that we start to put some boundaries like everything else. Um, that we do for parenting and be okay putting some boundaries on these things because it's so clearly affecting our mental health and their mental health that it's time that that we were okay with it. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and some things just real practical that I've done that have been helpful is the do not disturb, but things that you can use, you can really mm-hmm. limit. So for me, um, and really anyone, we know this from the dopamine um, pathways, those bi- those uh, alerts, right? Notifications. Mm-hmm. I literally have nothing that's notified on my screens. So I go in once in a while and check something that I want to do in my time, but I don't get notified. Um, and this is even like during my work day, I'm sure you in clinic as well. There's my phone is off. There's no like, I'm not doing text. I'm not doing, and it's so great because I can really focus on the patients and do my thing. Or if I just want to write, or if I want to be in those places. And I think um, again, modeling as parents, but also encouraging our children to take those breaks. Um, I just heard Liz Gilbert talk about um, from Wednesday night at like 10 PM till Friday morning, she puts her phone in a safe. Like it is totally inaccessible if she calls it the Sabbath. And I think a lot of people are doing that, but I really, really love that because that will break the cycle. And so if we could model that as parents and then talk to our children, maybe it's even just a few hours in the evening or at the dinner table, no phones or those kinds of things. They really, really do make a difference. Yep. So um, in our last few minutes, I want, just want to talk about like parenting at your child's pace. I want people to be able to get this book. So I want to know where we can find that. But if you had to give kind of a synopsis um, of, of what's some of the most important information there and why people should get the copy of the book themselves, give us a little summary here at the end about your book. Sure. So the, I mean, the big reasons why I wanted to write the book were number one, the stress piece that we talked about. I feel like parents are more stressed than ever. And so I wanted to write a book in a way that tried to help de-stress parents. So kind of comparing the past to the present and going through all the big questions that parents have that I get every day in the office. Um, because, you know, most of the books that are parenting books these days are written by therapists or moms, not really by pediatricians anymore. A lot of the pediatricians write like health books, like Dr. Song has a great new book, you know, and it's more about like health and wellness and those kind of things, not so much the like body training and, and the right. other things. So I wanted a book that was about that, but kind of synthesize the information to help parents think through it. So that was one big piece. And the other big piece was the health aspect, because I feel like the things that we mentioned with chronic disease, it's such a big issue. And something I always wanted to do was get ahead of it. I wanted to prevent disease and, and parenting books don't really talk about that. Because again, it's written by therapists, moms for the most part, and they're great books, but a doctor has a different training and a different viewpoint. Uh, and a lot of the touch point for parents in the first few years is the pediatrician. It's not really a, a therapist or or mm-hmm. you know other, other practitioners like that. So a lot of the questions do come through the lens of health. And I really started this book from that lens, talking about chronic disease, talking about the foundations of health, stress, sleep, environment, toxins, um, diet, those kinds of things. And I think that's very unique to a book. And especially for a integrative minded or holistic minded parent, I think it's something that they'll really enjoy because you get the regular parenting stuff, but it's a mixture of that with health. Uh, And I think that's really important right now with the direction that we're going so we can get ahead of things, think about some of these basics and really set up their life for success to help them be the most resilient. So I love that. And where can people find you more about you and get your book? So they can find me on Instagram or X at Dr. Joel Gator. And you can find the book everywhere that books are sold, Amazon or um, parenting at your child's pace.com. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Dr. Gator, thank you for being a light in the world for parents and for good, just a guide. Um, I love that you have this new book. I hope people will go out and grab a copy. And I hope that um, if you're listening out there and you're a parent, that this was helpful information. Sure. Appreciate you coming on today. 
Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Resiliency Radio. I hope you enjoy it. As you know, you can find all the episodes on my website, jillcarnahan.com, along with transcripts and audio or anywhere you listen to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever. Please do like, subscribe, share this so that we can get the more information out and we will see you next week.